Welcome. The image on the left is the cover of Popular Science magazine from October 1920. It's a painting by Norman Rockwell that shows a perpetual motion machine. A perpetual motion machine is a hypothetical machine that operates or produces useful work indefinitely or produces more work or energy than they consume. Now, generally speaking, perpetual motion machines violate the first and or second laws of thermodynamics. And in particular, many designers fail to take into account energy loss to friction between moving parts or other sources of thermal losses. This particular device is known as an overbalanced wheel, or Bhaskara's wheel, named after a 12th century Indian mathematician. Leonardo da Vinci studied several versions of overbalanced wheels and proved that they could not work. He realized that as the weight moves farther from the rotation axis, the gravitational torque on it is greater, but the moment of inertia of the wheel is simultaneously increased, so the gravitational torque is less effective. So the perceived gain of having an increased moment arm which would generate a continuously positive torque on the right-hand side of the wheel is not gained after all. I'm Dr. Courtney. In this problem, we're asked to find the coefficient of friction between a sled and a snowy slope. We're told that the velocity is constant, and so we know that the coefficient of friction is non-zero. If there were no friction, then the child would accelerate down the hill. Since we're dealing with forces, masses, accelerations, we know we're dealing with Newton's second law. We denote the coefficient of friction by the Greek symbol mu. We have an 11 degree slope and constant speed. As we develop this problem, we'll begin with a sketch of what's happening and then make a plan for how to evaluate the problem. We have an 11 degree slope and a child that is sledding down the hill on a sled. This direction, we're told that it's constant speed. It doesn't seem like we're given very much in this problem. We don't have the mass of the child. We don't know what that constant speed is. This might be a little unnerving, but in physics, when solving a problem, a good idea when you don't know what to do is to do what you know. So we know that we can make a point-by-point -point plan for solving this problem, and then we'll see if we need any more information. A good first step in solving a physics problem is to check the units, and we'll convert any units that aren't already in MKS to that system. Since we know we're applying Newton's second law, we're going to need a free body diagram that includes all the forces acting on the body as well as a coordinate system. Then we do want to go ahead and express Newton's second law in equation form. And because force and velocity and acceleration are vector quantities and because we're dealing, our motion is in two dimensions, we want to express Newton's law in component form, so separately for the x-direction and the y-direction. Next, we want to resolve vector components. So we have each, both the x and y components expressed for later substitution. Let's work with the y-direction first. And so this will be uh, from equation 3 in the y direction. And from that, uh, I'll tell you ahead of time, we're going to be able to solve for the normal force. Then we're going to substitute values in the x direction. 
And since we're dealing with the frictional force, but we, that's not what we're actually trying to compute. We're trying to compute the coefficient of friction, which is a quantity that appears in, in an expression for a frictional force. So we want to express the frictional force, which we'll call big F sub F, in terms of that coefficient of friction that we're trying to find and the normal force. So then we want to go ahead and substitute for that frictional force in the equation that we developed here in part 7. And then we can solve for that coefficient of friction that we're after. We will report it to the correct number of significant figures when we're all done. Now that we have a point-by-point -point plan, let's go ahead and evaluate this problem. First of all, the only quantity that we're given is the slope, which is given in degrees, and we don't need to convert any units beyond that. Next, we need a free body diagram that includes the child on the sled and all the forces acting on it. Now, we concentrate the mass of the child into a point mass. There is, of course, a gravitational force acting, which is equal to the mass of the child times gravitational acceleration. There is also, we need to consider the direction of the slope. So I'll just draw the slope here as a dashed line coming down the hill for the moment. Now because the child is sitting on that hill, there's a normal force acting perpendicular to the hill. The direction of motion is down the hill. The frictional force always opposes the direction of motion. So we draw the frictional force in this direction. Now we need to choose a coordinate system. We're dealing with vector quantities, and so anything that doesn't line up with the coordinate axes, we will have to resolve into components. So it behooves us to choose a coordinate system to our advantage. And in this case, let's choose the coordinate system so that positive x is downhill. That means then positive y will be in the same direction as the normal force. So now you can see only the gravitational force will have to be resolved into our x and y components. Let's draw what those look like. The x component of gravity will be acting down the hill, f, g, x. The y component will be acting perpendicular to that direction and opposite the direction of the normal force. So this is f, g, y. Let's draw a couple of other things on this diagram before we're finished. We know that the angle, we're going to need to know this angle theta in order to resolve the gravitational force into x and y components. That theta is equal to the same as the slope of the hill, which we're told is 11 degrees. So theta is also 11 degrees. Now we're ready to begin working with Newton's second law in symbolic form. Newton's second law says that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration vector. And then in component form, that means that the net forces in the x direction equal the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And similarly, the net forces in the y direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Now, we need to express our vector quantities in component form. Let's start with the gravitational force in the x direction. That is this one right here. That's going to be equal to the magnitude of the gravitational force times the sine of this angle, sine theta. The gravitational force itself is equal to the mass times gravitational acceleration. So we can express this as mg sine theta. Similarly, in the y direction, we will have the gravitational force times the cosine of 11 degrees. Cosine theta. We'll leave it as theta for now. So that's equal to mg cosine theta. Now, we know that acceleration is also a vector quantity. However, we're told that the velocity is constant, or the speed is constant down the hill. So if the velocity is not changing, acceleration is zero.
So we want to make a note of that, that AX is 0 and AY is 0. Checking back with our plan, we are now going to work with the Y component of Newton's second law. So F net Y is going to be equal to the normal force plus the Y component of the gravitational force that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the Y direction. Now we've just determined that the acceleration in the Y direction is zero. So that term on the right hand side goes to zero. We also have an expression for the gravitational force in the Y direction. So the normal force plus mg cosine theta equals zero. And solving for the normal force, that's equal to negative mg cos theta. Now let's work with Newton's second law in the x direction. I'm going to go ahead and move over to the next board so that we can be more continuous about that process. So in the x direction, we have the frictional force acting, and we have the x component of the gravitational force. And that's equal to mass times the acceleration in the x direction. We also determined that the acceleration in the x direction is zero, so this term on the right hand side again goes to zero. We need to think about uh, the frictional force for a moment, and we made a plan to explicitly consider it for a moment. That is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now we just spent some time computing the normal force as we analyzed Newton's second law in the y direction, and so we can substitute that value so that now we have an expression for the frictional force in terms of the coefficient of friction, mass, gravitational acceleration, and the angle of the slope. So returning now to our Newton's second law in the x direction, we can substitute that. Minus mu mg cosine theta, and then we're going to substitute for the gravitational force in the x direction, which we determined in step four was mg sine theta, and as we've said, that is equal to zero. Just as a reminder, this mu is the quantity that we are after. So our next algebraic step will be to isolate that quantity. Let's add this term to both sides, so then we're left with mg sine theta on the left side and a positive mu mg cosine theta on the right hand side. This next step shows the advantage of working the expression symbolically before we substitute values. So we see then that if we divide through by the mass, mass cancels, and if we divide through by gravitational acceleration, that also cancels. And so we're left with a simpler expression of sine theta equals mu cosine theta. We're still looking to isolate mu, and so let's divide through by cosine theta on both sides. Now sine theta divided by cosine theta is tangent theta. And so we write the tangent of theta is equal to mu. So now we have one calculation to make on our calculator which is then the tangent of 11 degrees. So make sure your calculator is in degree mode before you do this. And we find then that that is equal to 0 0.1944. And reporting that to the correct number of significant figures, oh, let's see, I jumped ahead in my uh, plan. So here we're substituting 8 and 9. And step 10, we're solving for mu. And now step 11, we will report that to the correct number of significant figures, which we're only given one value, which was 11 degrees, to two significant figures. And so we will report the coefficient of friction between the slope and sled. is 0 
Before we conclude our work here, let's assess our answer to see whether it makes sense. Always a good idea to start that by checking our unit analysis. We avoided using any numerical values until the very end, and we only had to substitute a single value. The tangent of 11 degrees as 0.1944 has no units. It's not that I just left them off. Now, the coefficient of friction is also a unitless quantity, so those two things agree. What about the magnitude of the coefficient of friction of 0.19? Is that in the right ballpark? Well, we already said it needs to be greater than zero, otherwise the child is accelerating down the hill. So, as we think about the magnitude, we know that it needs to be greater than zero. Generally speaking, the coefficient of friction is often less than one. The coefficient of friction is determined experimentally uh, by as two specific materials rub against each other. Most coefficients of friction are less than one, and certainly a sled on a snow uh, surface is going to be less than one. But how can we tell whether 0.19 is fairly close to what we would expect? In this case, I went to an outside source to look up some coefficients of friction for certain surfaces, and I used, um, there are many resources you could use, I happened to use one called fizzlink.com and on fizzlink.com there are some values between surfaces that seem similar to the ones that we're considering. For example, it had waxed wood, so that would really apply more to skis, and wet snow. And the kinetic, the coefficient of kinetic, the kinetic coefficient of friction is given as 0.1. That means the coefficient of friction when one surface is already moving with respect to the other, which is what we have in this case. But if you have dry, uh, actually I got that backwards. No, that's right. And waxed wood and dry snow, the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.04. So if we're talking about essentially skis, waxed skis on wet snow, we have a kinetic coefficient of friction of 0.1. We got something that is almost double that, but maybe the sled's plastic, maybe it has bumps, it's certainly not waxed or optimized for speed, so I can make an argument that our answer is a reasonable one, even though we can't make an exact match. So between our unit analysis and checking an outside source to see whether the magnitude makes sense, we have confidence that the answer we have come up with is the correct one.